Morning, everyone. Good to, good to see all you brave souls out here on Wednesday night, our first Wednesday night of the new year. And uh, so, uh, welcome. We welcome folks that are with us by way of Facebook and things on live stream. We continue trying to improve that. So, uh, as we go along the way with our uh, broadcasting, updating a lot of times with our computer programming and stuff. So we're thankful for Greg and uh, Aaron, the different ones that works back there, uh, to help us to be able to broadcast to do that. Um, Deborah's had to work late tonight and uh, stay over, so I'll have to lead this singing for us this evening. Lauren was stopped to get gas, run a little bit late, so she'll come on in and pick up wherever we are when we get through the, the place there. Um, pray for, I uh, got a call today from, you know, my friend Doug Watts. About three years ago, actually, um, uh, be four years, I guess, ago. No, three years ago. I uh, led him to the Lord over the telephone when uh, he uh, found out he had cancer and used to play uh, a lot of golf with him and things when I lived back in Kentucky. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful fellow, his family. He's uh, very ill at this time, has been in the hospital, I think, since the 26th of December. Uh, they have him on a feeding tube. I talked to his wife this morning, and uh, unless things change, uh, it's just, you know, it seems to be a short time. So, Doug Watts, we'll remember him in our prayers tonight. We got several on, the, on our prayer list, as you noticed. We want to pray for Joanne. Uh, she's not feeling well. She's going to have to be getting some tests and things uh, done. Pray for her. Pray for Amy, having problems, pain with her hip. Uh, we'll pray uh, for you, Amy. Uh, continue praying for Millie Falzone, I guess. Uh, she had a bad bout of that uh, Flu, found out yesterday that uh, Stephanie Counts has uh, COVID, uh, so pray for her. Uh, she's pretty sick. And uh, Ray McNabb, the head COVID, he's doing fine. He, don't, he still don't believe he had it. Uh, he's one tough bird, I'll tell you now. Um, and uh, I, I talked to him today, and so hopefully uh, next week, if everything settles down at the nursing home there at Springfield Villa. We'll uh, get a chance to go and have a service next Tuesday within the chapel for them there. So we want to pray for them. Do you have someone that you mention and I'll try, we'll mention tonight. Uh, anyone else you can think of? Janice Johnson, of course. Janice had that hip joint placement, you know, and uh, is doing quite well, I think, when I talked to Mike the other day. Uh, we want to pray for Daniel. Um, he and uh, uh, Paige, is that her name? Yeah, uh, went down to Houston. Coming, I guess, probably back tomorrow. You think? To okay, so they'll so they'll probably be traveling back around Friday or Saturday or something. So. We want to continue praying for them. He's down there. He's a young man, remember, that has stage four cancer. And uh, they're trying to do different treatments and things with him. Okay, anyone else? I know we pray for Natalie's sister, Cindy. She comes occasionally here, lift her up. And old Jake that was with us over Christmas, you know, he's gone back to Texas uh, to... It's not boot camp anymore, I don't guess, but he's there training, and we want to pray for him. Uh, God's direction in his life as he pursues this through the military with firemen and also getting out and maybe getting a good job uh, in, uh, here in Springfield would be the, our best hopes <laughs> uh, for that uh, down the road. Okay, anyone else? Oh, thank you. Yes, Danny. Um, Danny White uh, wasn't feeling too good Sunday. They got over the COVID, I think, stuff, her and Charles, but continue praying for them. 
Anyone else you can think of? Uh, Okay, Dixie, your friend Scott Buckman. Okay. All right, honey. Cancer patient. And we want to pray for, um, uh, uh, continue praying for Ken. Uh, I don't see you. You just sneak on in here. I don't even see you. I've been looking at you. Well, when did you get here, Lauren? Oh, <laughs> come on in, honey. Um, and let's see. Yeah, we'll pray for them. So anybody else? Pray for our country. You know, with uh, you, if you've been watching news, all the things they're doing uh, in Congress, uh, <clears throat> pretty crazy up there. I guess we're better off if they do nothing than it is if they do something. Uh, if they can't convene in Congress, that might be a good thing for all of us, you know, up here. But they need our prayers, I'll tell you. Uh, people just need to seek the Lord. And he says, if you lack wisdom, James chapter 1, verse 5, ask God, and he'll give you wisdom in James 1, 5. And, they, 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 and to follow, when you get it, you can get the information, but you've got to follow it, you know. And sometimes I, th- I feel like, and I think that's probably with me, is that I, I have that dry spell where the Lord don't give it to me because he says, I gave it to you, and you didn't do what it did, so why should I tell you again? Um, but I think sometimes we fall into those categories of not following through with what God tells us, you know, within our hearts. So our country needs that. People all over the world, Ukraine, so much stuff going on, but in God's great scheme of things it's all working out for his glory and I know that's hard to see but he, remember God is in the business of turning messes into miracles and we can rely on it. he's done it before and he can do it again let's go Lord in prayer thank you Father for your blessings thank you Lord that you hear our prayers and you know all those that are sick and those that Uh, who've lost loved ones. Uh, Father, I just pray for comfort for them. And uh, Lord, I pray for Doug and his family right now that's just waiting. And I I pray that you, according to your will, through the doctors, medications, divinely, or Father, I know Doug is ready to come home and to be with you. So we ask that your will be done, and we'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to sing Higher Ground, Miss Lauren, if you'll tune us up there. Let's stand up, stretch your feet there for a minute, and your legs, and reach out your arms. And uh, Some of you has been asleep, and things, you know, you can kind of stretch out there a little bit. I'm pressing on the upward way. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven. Heaven's table land, a higher play than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch the gleam of glory bright 
But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Hey, pretty good. You know, one thing I did notice, I forgot to say, choir, come on up here, or praise team, or whatever. So we only got one more to go, so it's not worth the pay, is it? Okay, well, I'll carry you. Stay right there. All right, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miss Lauren. Good singing, good songs. Isn't them old songs there? Um, what, a, what a blessing. We're in Philippians chapter 3 tonight uh, as we start our Bible study. Philippians chapter 3. If you uh, have your Bibles, uh, there's one in the pew if you don't, and Greg, I have some scriptures up on the screen for you. Uh, here, and in, in looking at, I guess you got to pick up chapter 1, chapter 2. Remember, Paul's in prison. He's under house arrest in Rome. And he's writing back to uh, the Christians who are at Philippi. And he's trying to... Uh, remind them uh, that really when you comes down to remember chapter 2 is about character of how the Christian lived and the, the things about the Christian life but encouraging sometimes it's so easy for us to give up uh, get discouraged I find it interesting that you know 
that in the New Testament and in those days right after Christ, that you can follow that thread all along. So when people say that when you become a Christian, it's just a bed of roses, you'll never have problems, and, and man, you'll be happy all of your life, and, and everything just will go well, and, and things like that. And we know that's not true, isn't it? That, that's the, I think that's sometimes something that is misgiving. to people. Now, we shouldn't say, um, like some people have when people get saved and they throw cold water, and they're so happy and everything's wonderful, and oh, you know, when you first, and that burden's lifted of your sins and your problems, and you get saved. And we used to call it the preachers. We go to uh, Bible college and, uh, of course, in class with, all these preachers and college and ministers of sorts, and they talk about uh, how the old folks would throw cold water on the ones that would get saved and go and say, oh, you'll get over it, don't worry about it, you know. It, uh, oh, they'll be, yeah, they're that way, they're on fire right now, but just wait till uh, you're as old as me or you've been a Christian as long as I have, and you'll see a th- few things, and before you know it, uh, and say throwing water on the fire. Well, we don't need to throw any water on it. The devil will take care of that, won't he? And real life issues will take care of that. So notice starting in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul starts out saying, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is grievous, but for you, it is safe. So, what does that mean? Look at it. Finally, my brethren, of course, that's Christians, that's believers. What did you say there in verse 1? Rejoice in the Lord. Have you ever wondered why it is that we have to encourage Christians to rejoice and I'm just going to say because nobody out there in Facebook land is listening right now. But I've had people who have told me over the last few years that somebody's watching us on Facebook. And they'll say, why don't those people up in choir smile? I says, probably because the ones out in the congregation aren't smiling either. And he says, why, why don't they smile? And I said, I'm going to tell them one of these days when it's the appropriate time. So when you guys are up there, remember. Now, I don't want you faking it. You know, you know, as I have, having a good smile. That, that didn't going to look good if you're faking it. But I want you to be conscious of this is the thing. Paul was saying to them, rejoice in the Lord. You've heard me say one of the biggest problems in the church and the problems that we have is what's missing in the church is joy. What's missing in most of our Christian lives. We are the church. We born again believers. Look at right here, you know, 60 something years after uh, the the fact of Jesus' uh, birth, 30, 40 years after his crucifixion, and you you got this big upstart, a revival going of thousands of Christians, people getting saved, becoming Christians, and churches that are started. And here, is the Apostle Paul of preachers of saying, having to remind Christians, rejoice in the Lord. To, you know, here to be happy, that is that in the Lord, the idea is that it's the duty of Christians to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. This duty implies these following things. We should rejoice that we have such a Savior. You see, People everywhere have felt a need to have a Savior. They felt a, feel a need to have a void field in their life. Sometimes they do it with bottles and drugs, you know, alcohol, drugs. They do it with other things. They, they find false religions and all kinds of different things. But there is nothing that can fill the void in our life as our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. You see, when we think of our sins, we rejoice that there's one who can deliver us from our sins. Nobody else has anyone that can do that. Uh, We can rejoice that there's one who can deliver us from them. When we think of of the worth of our soul, what are we worth? We can rejoice that we, we are saved from death. 
from the sting of death, from the victory of death. Our Savior has saved us. We rejoice in the Lord. Why should I rejoice? We've got enough things to think about that we can talk and, and praise the Lord for. We can rejoice that there is one who can rescue us from the peril of danger when it comes. We pray to the Lord when we're afraid or when things are happening to us that we, we, we just we want to call out, and he's there. He reminds us that he'll watch over us, and he can bring us to a place that is safe. And, of course, uh, the ultimate place is going to be heaven, isn't it? But we may also rejoice, in fact, when he's saying that we should rejoice, is that Jesus accomplishes just what he says that he will do. And we need someone to make known to us the way of pardon for our sins, and Jesus does that to know that we're forgiven, to lift off the burden of our guilt, all the different things that we have, because uh, you know what guilt will do to you. You know what... um, anxiety does to you in fears or frustrations or disappointments and we need someone that will support us through trials and bereavements when we face death and all the different and Jesus does that you know so when when Paul reminds the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord he is speaking to them to say to, to know that the Lord will comfort us on our deathbed he will guide us through the dark valley and and uh, the difficulties that we have within life. So that was when he was saying to them, because remember where he's writing, and he summarized this by saying, finally, my brethren, the last thing he was saying to them was wrapped up in these next two chapters, chapter 3, chapter 4. And I think the principle of joy of a true Christian should be in the Lord. In fact, I I remember Jesus saying in John 15, he says, my joy I give to you and no man takes away from you. You know, the joy that he gives us is uh, when we have the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, that he gives us this joy. Um, I I remember hearing an old preacher, one of my, it could have been one of my, maybe it was uh, one of my professors, I can't remember, back years ago, been so long since I've been there, and said, you know, if you don't want somebody to steal your goat, don't tell him where it's tied up. Uh, and sometimes we talk and complain. That's like for the, uh, like with your joy or with the problems that you have or something. The devil, the devil can't read your mind like Jesus does. Um, he doesn't know what's going on inside your mind and things, but he does hear what you speak what you show, how you do those things. And so you tell him, you let him know when you complain, when you murmur, when you grumble, when you do these things or you talk it out to those things. He does hear that and know and all the demons of hell will attack you into the areas of your life and it's hard, it suppresses you and puts a heavy burden upon you to which you're just at the point that you can barely function as a Christian, and we have to be reminded. And we'll get, in, in verse 2, we'll get to that in just a moment. When he says in, uh, I guess in, in the sense of this, is that the Christian should never leave the impression upon uh, others that your faith, your religion, uh, shouldn't make you gloomy, or sullen or ill-tempered, that your faith in Christ, and that that would be the case of what we need to know and to understand when we rejoice in the Lord always, yea, I say rejoice to do that. And he says that he writes in verse 1 here, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord, notice this, to write the same things to you. And what he's saying here is that he's spoken it to them. He is now reminding them, and it's good that it's written down because now it becomes a permanent thing, something that we benefit from because he has said this to them. And when he says this, it's to repeat the same truths and the same admonitions. Tell you again, I, 
I've heard repetition is one of the best ways of learning things. That when you have, you know, for repetition. And to have to do it, we have to do that because we do the same thing. I remember, uh, I think it was W.A. Criswell down at uh, First Baptist of Dallas. He's gone to, on to be with the Lord, but uh, he was a giant in the Christian faith and Southern Baptist Convention for years. W.A. Criswell wore a white suit, preached, and he said, uh, I heard him in a convention one year preaching, and he said, he said this preacher came for a trial sermon, and, or came for revival, I believe it was, came for a revival, and he was preaching in a revival, and he preached on uh, John 3.16, first night. John 3.16, the second night. John 3.16, the third night. Finally, the deacons pulled him aside and said, preacher, he said, can you talk to him? He said, hey, don't he have any other thing besides a... John 3, 16, and he's just preaching that and said, can, do you, can, can't you, can you talk to him and, and, and kind of tell him, say, we've done heard that and things like that. And uh, so he went to the young man and talked to the evangelist, told him, said, uh, deacons have come. They all talk, said, well, you, uh, they, they're getting tired of that, uh, you know, just John three sixteen, you know, just hearing all that again stuff. He said, uh, when are you going? He said, well, he said, I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, I've got plenty of sermons, got all kinds of other things. He said, but I was just preaching that. He said, there's no use moving on until they do something about John three sixteen. You know, do something about what God's given you in your life before you start expecting God to give you something else. Sometimes we want a smorgasbord, pick and choose. You know, that we're looking at things to do and to see. And so this is how we get stuck into these things. When Paul said to write to you the same things, to me is not grievous. And in other words, it's not burdensome it's, it's, uh, or oppressive to him to repeat these exhortations. Say, hey, I'm good with it. I can tell you again. The old, old story never gets old with me. You know that when it's going, you say, I've heard that before. I've read, yeah, I've heard people that's read through the Bible, or the whole Bible. Well, I guess you're one and done. You know, you're, you're good. You know, you, you've got it all down now. You've read the whole Bible through. And all the, the problem with people who, and, and I challenge you in this, is reading the Bible through is how much of the Bible has got through. You understand. It's good to read the Bible through. But I wouldn't be doing no speed reading to see how quick I can read through it. You know, read it with understanding. Read it with the fact of God speaking to you, absorbing, like a sponge that's in there. That, and squeeze that baby and put her down in that water and you get it full. You know, lay it down into the living water, you know, the Word, and, and let's just soak it up. Soak up the Word. Let it become, because remember Psalms 119.11? Thy Word have I hid in my heart, that I may not sin against God. You know, to let that come into us. So Paul said, hey, it's, it's, to me, it's not grievous to write these things, to repeat or to exhort you again. But for you, it is safe, and that was to say, it contributes to the security of you as a Christian to have these sentiments and these admonitions. Now they're on record. It's written down. And, saying, and you, you might, if I told you, 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 you might have forgotten what I told you. A lot of times we do that, don't we? That we forget. But if it's in writing, you see, that's a good thing about the Bible. It says it, the, the Word of God doesn't change. And so if you ever have doubts, you can always go back and to look and to see, and there it is. It says, have you ever uh, thought, well, the Bible says this, and you come to find out, well, it didn't quite say that. We remember things a little bit different, or sometimes we get it a little bit twisted as time goes along. That's happened to me. I've had to go back and correct myself several times and through life as I've learned. And look, I go back and say, wait a minute. Even after I preach a sermon, <clears throat> sometimes I'll say 1 Timothy 1 7, God's not given us a spirit of fear, power, love, joy, mind, whatever. And then, and it's really 2 Timothy 1 7. And I, I'm sitting there, did I say 1 7 or 2 7 there when I was saying that? I'll go back now. I go look back in the Bible. Ah, I just 
2 Timothy 1 7, you know, and I ha- I go back and, s- and I'll say, Oops, I messed up last week. I should have said this, you know, and uh, rather than get caught up in the moment. So sometimes it's good that it's written down, it is what it is. So the dangers, I think that Paul was bringing up to them was for their safety when he was saying, but for you it is safe because they were exposed to dangers uh, that were coming up. And look at verse 2, beware of dogs. These are the dangers that the Apostle Paul specifies to them. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So when he's saying beware of dogs, dogs... You know, this is interesting. Dogs in, in the East uh, are mostly without masters. They just, they run in all over, wandering through streets and fields, and uh, they feed off of, uh, that's not too good, entrails and internal organs of dead animals and things, whatever they can find in places, even upon cor- corpses of people who have died. You think about Ukraine, there are places in the wars where people are laying in the street of uh, things that they're, they're, dogs just go through. Here, uh, we got little Josie and little, uh, little Billy or whatever, little, and dogs are treated like children. You know, they, they take them to the hospital. We take them, uh, they're treated with such, and, and to us, maybe the name dog wouldn't be so bad, you know. Uh, I know I've heard some people say, hey, what's up, dog? You know, uh, like uh, we use it in, in our vernacular or, or something when people uh, are using it. But when Paul says, beware of dogs, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 43, and 2 Kings 8, 13, uh, you'll find where the Jews um, called pagans, the pagans, dogs. And Muslims call Jews and Christians by the same name as to being dogs. They were not, that was not a complimentary thing, by the way. The term dogs used to denote a person that is shameless, uh, impudent, malignant, snarling, dissatisfied, contentious, to use the, uh, the phrase of, of being called a dog to act so. Uh, the reference is basically what Paul was referring to here is uh, Judaizing teachers. And they were contentious, they were troublesome, uh, dissatisfied, and produced disturbance within the church. People who come in, in into the church, but they wanted to tie in the Old Testament laws that they were still coming in. This was the danger. The strong language that Paul was using here really uh, was the emphasis of what he was saying to the church. You know, Khrushchev said that, um, they would, uh, that you know, it wouldn't, Russia didn't have to attack America. Well, America would destroy itself from within. Uh, that was philosophical. That was a wise words of what he was saying because it's exactly what's happening in our world today. And, uh, but the same is true. And it started, didn't start today or now, about the church, our Christian faith. Starting with uh, uh, college and institutions and different things, the training in our, in our school systems. When you look at to see how tearing down the Christian faith is this happening, but inside the church, even is that our churches are filled more with Democrats and Republicans than it's filled with Christians. We're filled more with political and philosophical ideas and our, our rights and things rather than God's right of what God says to us, what God tells us and guides us within our life. So you can see that corruption creeping in, and this is what... Paul was talking about the Judaizers coming in, these dogs. He said, beware of evil workers. And he's referring to the same persons that he had called or characterized as dogs, uh, as the reference to Jewish teachers whose doctrines and influences he regarded only as evil. 
Uh, we don't know what the nature of their teaching was, but really we can presume that it consisted uh, in urging uh, the obligations of the Jewish rites and ceremonies that they carried out, speaking of the advantage of having been born Jews and urging a compliance with the Jewish law in order to justify themselves before God, that they had to do certain things. So this was a way their teachings tended to corrupt uh, the sense of salvation that we look at as by grace through faith. Jesus came and provided that for us. So uh, Paul said, beware of dogs. He said, beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. The word concision here was the uh, mutilation. Uh, gets into uh, contrast with uh, circumcision. This was what he was dealing with here. Again, goes back to the teaching of the Jews when they were teaching because they believed their teaching was uh, that salvation depended upon uh, the fact of this, that was their covenant with God. Remember where circumcision started out with, with Abraham, and how that God had them to do this, you know, as a covenant uh, to make. And, and that was, a, uh, you know, that, that was a cutting away of flesh. So when you look at that, and I think this is the, but the true circumcision that Paul was emphasizing is the circumcision of the heart. So go to verse 3, and you'll notice uh, he, this continues to build and clarify what was said here previously. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. There, there is the lean to where sometimes some people believe that, uh, well, I just can't live good enough to be a Christian. You see, this is fleshly things. This is saying, uh, I just don't know that I can stick with it. I can't to do this or that. Isn't it wonderful that we're not living by that law, that we have to be good enough to please God? or to try to uh, live by not doing this or feeling this certain way, because we who are Christians, and, and we hold the true doctrine of circumcision, then we have that which was intended to be secured by this right, for we're led to renounce the flesh and to worship God in the Spirit. This is what Paul is talking about. So uh, when he says, which worship God in Spirit, this is the internal nature of man. We're more than flesh. We are a spiritual being. This is the eternal part of us because no flesh and blood will inherit the kingdom of God. And so no matter how fat, how skinny, how tall, how short, no matter if you're crippled up or walking straight or whatever you do, and the, the, sorry, the flesh, you can build it, body build it, you can look whatever. It's flesh is going back to the dust of the earth. No flesh, no blood will inherit the kingdom of God. And so again, he says, there if you'll notice, uh, and this is uh, what we come to is rejoice in Christ Jesus. We have through him, therefore, renounced the flesh and have become true worshipers of God. And that's what we're called upon to do is that when we uh, come to that part of confession and repentance, we die to ourselves. Uh, we die to the flesh and fleshly desires to the best of our abilities to do that. But as long as you're in the flesh, you're still going to have those battles of the flesh. Warring, there's a warfare of your of spirit and flesh. Like Paul said, he said, the things I, I want to do, I, in Romans, he says, the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And I would say the 99.9% .9 of folks in here uh, probably would say, yeah, that's true to do that. So he said, have no confidence in the flesh. He's talking to the brethren. He's talking to 
new believers, people he's led to the Lord there at Philippi, people that's come into the church, Christians that are there, and it's being corrupted by people who are inside the church, and they're trying to guide them away to the old things, and they're trying to guilt them because they are not any longer bound by the law or legalism, things that were built up on. So any of the ordinances that they had, uh, he says the word flesh here seems to refer uh, to every advantage by which uh, we may have a birth or external conformity to the law. Uh, some of them took pride in the fact that they were born a pure Jew or whatever. So look at verse 4. Uh, when they were thinking, well, we're of this faith, we're, we're of that true line. Verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, then he says, I am more. And then Paul explains this, when he's talking about this, is that uh, he, through this advantages of any kind, if anyone could have trusted in the advantages of the flesh, then he could do it more because he was, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. His mom and his dad were Jews. He was a Pharisee. He, he grew up in this way. He, Paul was a lawyer. He, he persecuted the Christians. He, did, uh, he was circumcised uh, the eighth day. That He said, look at verse 5. Circumcised on the, the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. He said, if anybody can brag on the flesh and say, if the flesh would get you to heaven, uh, then I, I certainly, I would be one of the first ones in line if we could do it that way. But why is it that he realized that flesh won't get you to heaven? It's because he had a personal engagement with the Lord Jesus Christ, wasn't it? In Acts, I think, maybe chapter 16, uh, but when on the Damascus Road. But what he was doing was, and he'll get into this, uh, when he said circumcised the eighth day, uh, that was the law uh, to, when circumcision was in, that on the eighth day that uh, it was required of every male child to be circumcised on that day. Paul said of the stock of Israel, he descended from the patriarch Israel, or Jacob, Benjamin, remember was the, Let's see, was he the oldest son of Jacob? Uh, middle son of Jacob? Ah, he's the youngest, uh, uh, if, if you remember. Uh, so Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob. And um, his, but, you know, this is, of course, his brother uh, was his, uh, his full brother, I'm saying, was who? Notice I said full brother, not half brother. Yeah, Joseph, yeah. And uh, you, so you th then that makes you recall the story. Joseph and Benjamin and all that's coming down. Then look what happened. Saul, Saul, before he became apostle Paul, was a Benjamite. He was born in the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the interesting part of this is, it's not all that of the stock of Israel, that he is saying of the true stock, that he wasn't like some of the, uh, those that broke off because only Benjamin and Judah became the southern uh, tribe, and there was the northern tribes of the other ten that was come, and they rebelled against God. They, they joined in with pagans and stuff. They fought each other, all the different things, things that happened. That come under the rule of Jeroboam. Uh, so Paul said, I wasn't a proselyte, man, I was born into this. This is, you know, when it comes to looking at it, say, so if you want to brag, and so all those Judaizers that came into the church, they were just bragging and doing this. And so Paul was reminding him, he puts it in writing. And it reminds him of the Christian faith because the encouragement to remind him not to, not to be pulled aside or swayed. And when he talks about this tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, uh, he had every advantage of any Hebrew having. Touching the law of Pharisees, he says, and the Pharisees was the legal. They were very, um, very self-righteous in, in, in the Pharisees. And they even added 
to the laws, the written laws. They wrote their own rules and laws, and, and they, being the legalistic part, made binding laws upon people, and then they would carry those things out. The Sadducees were less strict than the Pharisees. And so Paul was saying it because Paul was a part of the Sanhedrin, which was the legalistic court. And when you look at that, man, I mean, uh, you know, he had a pedigree. And all the different things that he had, and it's amazing. And, of course, you know how, look at verse 6, concerning zeal, he said, persecuting the church, touching uh, the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So he was saying, showing, he was protecting, he thought he was protecting his church. When he saw Stephen, he held the coat of Stephen when Stephen was stoned to death. And uh, because Stephen was preaching Jesus, and, and this movement was spreading so fast that at the church of the Pharisees, Sadducees, they felt threatened by Jesus. And because people were following and Jesus' teachings, and they couldn't refute anything that Jesus was saying. They tried. And so the best thing they could do was to put him to death, trump up false charges, stop him, do whatever they could to keep that message from being spread abroad. And they tried to do that. You know, this is the very thing. that we, This is our heritage church. This is what we have come through. This is our bloodline in Jesus Christ. So Paul says in verse 6 there, that he was, you know, he asked the head of the Sanhedrin uh, if, if he could go and arrest and bring charges and, and, and to put Christians to death. That's why he was going to Damascus. And he was on that road to go, and per they had heard, and they were hiding. If you read the story of when Paul was going, is that Ananias, who was, that God spoke to it, when he was hiding in his home or wherever he was hiding, that when he says, and I want you to go down and lay hands on, pray for a guy, you know, and, uh, you know, this is the, uh, and he says, and he tells Saul after he becomes Paul on the road when he's blind in light, the Lord, personal experience of Jesus. Who art thou, Lord, that I, I'm Jesus who you persecute? I never persecuted you, Lord. You know, no, but you persecuted mine. You know, God takes it personal when when the world is going to persecute us as Christians. They're doing that against God. They're doing that against Christians and the, the church. Whatever this is, this will be held to their account at the judgment time of when that comes. So Saul couldn't see. And he said, what would you have me do? And he told him. He gave him a commission and arise. And he said, go into Damascus. There'll be a man that will pray for you there. So God prepared him, prepared Ananias, and to lay hands and pray. And he was fearful of doing that. You know, can you imagine? He said, well, he's, gonna come, he's coming to kill all of us. That'd be a hard thing to do, wouldn't it? But it's a lot of faith. It takes a lot of faith to trust and believe. God spoke to your heart and told you to do something and and you just go by faith doing it, not knowing how it's going to happen. But, Lord, I'm going to try. That's what God wants. Oh, that pleases him when you'll just trust him. Trust and obey, isn't it what the song says? For there's what? No other way to be happy in Jesus. Amen. So when he was speaking about touching righteousness, which is the law in verse 6 there, uh, he refers uh, not just merely to the ceremonial law, but the meaning that he did all that he could, uh, could do to be done to obtain salvation by just observance of the law and all those things just wasn't good enough. He didn't do it, and he was saying he wasn't. And that, that was where it was leading because uh, Paul really led a moral upright life but that just wasn't good enough no one had occasion to blame or to accuse him as a violator of the law of God although they tried to when they come into the church and they would put blame upon him as being a traitor a turncoat from the true religion you know to do that we can we can be blinded can't we we get caught so much up into what we believe uh 
that if we aren't careful, that we don't realize what we believe is not true or accurate. And uh, I think that's the hard part with tradition. Sometimes even in churches get caught up being Baptist, being Methodist or Catholic or into our denominations, into our traditions, when what's really important is the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think that people that whether you're Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian, whatever you are, that when you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that you will be the very best Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, whatever, that you can be a true one because you have that relationship personally with God. And that can only come through Jesus Christ. So that is the thing that we have to hold to uh, and to embrace within our lives because that's the only way it's going to be pleasing to God is that if we follow him. So when he's saying it, we'll pick up with verse 7 next week, uh, just saying, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. We'll end with it, we'll begin with it. So all the things that Paul was saying that I counted as being something, when he, when he gave his life to Christ, when he surrendered himself there, when he humbled himself for it. God struck him down in a miraculous way. And with all the things, his education, uh, his business, his finances, we don't ever hear anything about uh, Paul's wife, his family. We don't, we don't hear anything about that. But the Bible doesn't say that the Apostle Paul was married. But... We know he was. How do you know he was? It was a requirement of the Sanhedrin. In order to be a part of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. And so we know, therefore, that Paul was married, but nothing is ever said of the Apostle Paul's uh, family life. But yet he writes more about the family life than any other um, writer in the New Testament. Paul is attributed as to uh, written more of the books in the New Testament than any other writer in the New Testament. I think eight or nine, I think. Uh, I attribute Hebrews to him as well, the book of Hebrews. Um, so when you think about that, to think here he is in his life, he says, uh, what things were gained to me, those I have count lost for Christ. I don't have any bragging rights for anything now. You know, I could brag with you all day long that I was brought up from the tribe of Benjamin, whether it was pure, that was true, and to be a Jew in my race or in my whatever. It's not a matter of whether you're white or black or whatever in coming to Christ. It, it, it is, it's a matter of you are a part of God's creation and all have sinned, and Jesus came to die on the cross for all of our sins, that whoever calls on him shall be saved. And that's, that's just the, the beginning. Uh, we'll see the end one day when we cross over, won't we, to do that. All right. Well, any word from anyone in question before we go tonight? I want to thank you for coming and being here as we worship the Lord together. Pray with me as we dismiss. Thank you, dear Father, for allowing us to meet in this room in your presence. As always, Lord, we ask you to forgive us and to cleanse our hearts. Cleanse us through the, the precious blood of our Savior, your Son, Jesus. Not just once in salvation, but every day in our walk with you, may we be reminded of how we need to be filled by the Holy Spirit and to rejoice in you and to be thankful for all your blessings and for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thank you and good night. And I will see you on Sunday morning.